I really don't um, have any injuries to talk about um, other than uh, Patrick's and he's in protocol there. So, um, and we'll just follow that and see how he, how he does here the next couple of days. Um, uh, so with that, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the game. I had a chance to look at it on, on tape and review it. I sure like the effort of the players. Um, I thought they came out and played four quarters of good aggressive football. I like the um, sum, summarizing it. I, I like the game plans that both coordinators had and, uh, and Dave had on, on special teams. Um, I thought the defensive scheme that Spags put together against what I thought was a very explosive offense, um, both in the run and the pass game was, was tremendous. I thought the players played uh, and challenged that way. They had a lot of confidence in the game plan. Uh, Badger had the, the interception, uh, Big Chris had uh, that last series that, you know, he just bared down and did some beautiful things. Dan's um, uh, tackle, um, it was created, uh, which created a safety there. I mean, that was a great job by him um, and, and so on. So anyways, there were a bunch of personal things that, that came through. Uh, Sneed, I thought, you know, for being in his first playoff game, I thought he did a nice job as a young guy. So all positive things on the offensive side. Um, Patrick was actually having a, a really good game up until, up until that point. I thought our offensive line um, did a nice job against what I thought was the strength of that defense and uh, that front. And so uh, they bared down and got the run game going early and we had a nice little mix going there. Um, uh, and then Obviously, when Pat goes out, now Chad comes in, and uh, I was proud of all the guys around Chad that had, had that confidence in him. And Chad, I told you, Chad mentioned that to the team as he broke the team down uh, uh, after the game. So, uh, but I, I thought Chad uh, played with great composure, uh, particularly for that situation. Then for it to come down to the last, the last series there, the big run that he had was was great. He, he duff, dusted off those old legs and got him moving a little bit, um, came up a hair short and then came back and made a nice throw to Tyreek uh, to clinch it. Um, anyways, I, again, um, I, I thought all the coaches had, had uh, input, um, not only in the game plan, but also during the game on both sides of the ball. There was great communication on the defensive side, offensively. Um, I was I was part of that uh, just with, with talking and, um, you know, between EB, Mike Kafka, Joe Blameyer, Greg Lewis, all, uh, Tom Melvin, all those guys, uh, D-Lind, um, everybody was talking and putting, giving input that was productive. And, and so um, I just, again, really appreciated that <clears throat> when it came down to the uh, last minute of the game, when sometimes people can go silent um, on the, on the headset, uh, there was good communication there. And um, I mentioned that Joe gave a heads up when uh, it was prior, it was the call prior to um, the throw that, listen, we might, uh, it was actually the play that Chad ran it, but it, the, listen, we might, we might need a uh, fourth down call if you decide to go that way. You get a potential big call coming up here, coach. So, you know, one of those deals. So he gave me a nice heads up. And um, and then um, Mike Kafka reminded me that uh, of what the quarterbacks had on their script the night before on fourth and one to win the game. And, and EB gave me the thumbs up. I mean, you know, so everybody was involved. It was, you know, and that's really what it's all about. We'll need that same thing obviously coming up this week against a great Buffalo team. So, um, and I, I'm, I'm honored that we're, we're able to play in front of our, our home crowd. And I, I know they'll be out of their minds um, as, uh, and help lead us uh, on through this game. So again, much appreciated all the fan support. Anyways, with that time, George. Let's go first to Adam Teicher. Go ahead, Adam. 
Uh, hey, Andy, um, regarding the decision to go for it on fourth down, <clears throat> you've made that same decision in similar circumstances, obviously, several times this year now. Has your philosophy, your, your thoughts on trying to convert on fourth down in those situations changed at all uh, over the years? And, and Brad, I'll have a quick follow-up as well. Well, listen, I, I think all of us as, as coaches, offensive coaches or head coaches or whoever is making that decision for that team, would tell you that the philosophy hasn't necessarily changed, but you're going to evaluate things that might change around your thinking. So maybe it's, um, you know, your football team and the, the quality of players that you have. And, and, the, and then at that moment, uh, what's, you know, how are you feeling about that situation at that particular time in the game? Uh, you know, and so on. I mean, there are a few things that go into that. So I would tell you that, um, obviously this team is, uh, this offense is a veteran group of guys and I've got trust in them. And, uh, um, you know, so I, I just felt that, that it was okay to go there. I mean, I had another situation down earlier that we didn't go and we attempted a field goal. So uh, there time, there's a time and a place uh, for everything. And uh, you just try to have a feel on that the best you can. All right. And when you do convert lately, you've been trying to throw the ball. When did fourth and one or fourth and two become a throwing down? Well, you know, I went to BYU, so every down's a throwing down. I mean, that's how that's how that goes. You know, um, I, I was educated that way by LaBelle Edwards and uh, throw any time, any place and uh, try to remain, keep a little bit of that with me as I've gone forward. So. I think if you have confidence in it, Adam, that that, uh, uh, that it's really no different than the run. I mean, you know, you're you're uh, in today's world, so anyways, I, I feel good about it. Let's go next to Herbie T.O.P. Go ahead, Herbie. Hey, Coach. Good uh, afternoon. I was getting ready to say good morning. Good afternoon. You've been around a lot of players who have been concussed before in your career. Um, and obviously there are some days that we're going to have to wade through here, but based on your experience, what is your optimism level that you will have Mahomes available uh, potentially for practice and even for the game? And Brad, I'll have another question. Yeah. So listen, I mean, Herbie, I, I just leave that with Rick and the docs and I, uh, because of the protocol, we don't, we, it's a no brainer from the coach's family. You don't have to think about it. You just have to go forward and make sure you have an answer. If he's there and an answer, if he's not there, uh, I can't tell you from a medical standpoint where he's at. I mean, I don't know that. So uh, that's their decision and I just follow it. So. Okay. And then coach, um, yesterday the CBS broadcast caught a little interaction on the sidelines between Tyree kill and then wide receivers coach, Greg Lewis. I'm curious if you saw that and uh, what did you say to uh, Tyreek after the game? Yeah, you know, that I, that was uh, – they were messing around. It wasn't like that was not a – I know how it came off, but if you know – if you know that – if you look at two minutes or a minute later, 30 seconds later, whatever it was, they're, they're laughing over there. So it's not – that wasn't a – that's a great room right there. And those guys are very close, and they're, they're lucky to have Greg, and they all know that. So he's been there, done that. He's got a great feel for those guys, and and uh, I, I think if you talk to both of them, they tell you that they were they were just messing around with him. So. Let's go next to Bob Fisco. Good, Bob. Hey, Andy, what was the I guess maybe the deciding factor that made you decide Chad Henney was the right guy for for backup for you guys when you signed him a couple of years ago? Yeah, so listen, I mean, it came down to both those guys, both Chad and, and Matt. Um, we're lucky to have both of them. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, you know, we had, it was almost a flip of a coin. Both of them had uh, strengths that we liked. And um, uh, Chad, uh, uh, not that, I mean, we listen, both guys have been successful here. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, tell, I don't want to compare the two. I want to just tell you that I think Chad's strengths are, uh, he's a tremendous leader. He's been there um, as a starter and he's, um, been there as a backup and I watched what he did as a backup and how he handled those situations uh, that he was in. And I thought he did that well. Um, and I thought it'd be a great fit for a young quarterback like Pat to have a good support unit that was had some experience. 
Let's go next to Nate Taylor. Go ahead, Nate. Hey, Andy, this may be secondarily on the injury with Patrick, but he did suffer what appeared to be a toe injury uh, in the first half. Is there any update on that injury and how that may play a role if he is allowed to practice, uh, if he is clear from the protocol? Yeah, I, I think he'll be okay there for right now, Nate, with the toe part. Yeah, I think we'll be all right there. Let's go next to Vahe Gregorian. Go ahead, Vahe. Hey, Andy, Brad, I'll have a follow-up after the first question. Andy, yesterday you seemed really um, just moved, actually, by how the team picked it up when Patrick was hurt. I wonder what that tells you you could expect out of the mindset next week if uh, Patrick can't play. And then, Brad, I'll have that follow-up. Yeah, listen, I mean, I, all the guys have confidence in Chad. I mean, it was uh, – um, if he has to be in there um, – I, I, you know, just like they did Matt the year before. And uh, it's the way those, those guys handle themselves. Um, and, and so I don't think, you know, that wouldn't change if, if he has to, if he has to play. I mean, I, I, I don't think twice about that. I just, if Pat can't go, then that's, then Chad jumps in and rolls. And the other thing, Andy, obviously the running game is, is part of Patrick's game and it's important. I, I just wonder how you, how do you process the risk reward in situations with Patrick and, and the run? I mean, you know, obviously it's hindsight that he got hurt, but how do you, what goes into your decision-making? Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it does happen. I mean, listen, it happens. Uh, it just hasn't happened much to him uh, over time here. So um, that'll still be part of the game. Um, depending on what the play is um, as we go down the road. But, uh, we'll just, let's just see how things work out this week for him. See how, see how it works. Let's go next to Sarin Petro. Go ahead, Sarin. And, and Brad, I'll have a follow-up as well here. Just to, to kind of go a little bit further on that, can, can you, you – I don't believe you've run the quarterback sneak since Patrick was hurt uh, in a game in Denver with, with the kneecap. Uh, just, you know, there are a lot of people wondering what, what's the difference between risking in a sneak versus being okay in the option? Is it, is it a play that generally you think is safer, gives them more chance to protect themselves? Is there a difference uh, between the, the safety issue and, and those types of different plays, those types of quarterback run plays? Yeah, so, you know, Serena, it gets you a little bit more out in space. Um, the ones that we use here as opposed to going up the middle and, you know, stating the obvious but yes okay yeah uh and then secondarily um I, you know i know the protocols take over and and all the doctors do all that is there a you know if he were cleared on a sunday morning having no practices uh would, would he be able to to play or is there a certain point during the week where you maybe not publicly but you and your head say okay he's missed too much and and he's out and we're going with chad well i'd hate to say it publicly well, I know, and I know you wouldn't. <laughs> um, but listen, I'm, I'll have to evaluate that as we go forward. You know, let's just see how this whole thing rolls. Let's go next to Sam Mellinger. Go ahead, Sam. Hey, Andy. Um, last night after the game, you used the term uh, intestinal fortitude, right, to describe what you were really proud of in the way that game ended. Um, you guys have a, the whole season has been close wins like that, right? I, I'm just wondering in your experience, how, how rare or, or common is it to have a team that has this level of whatever that is, intestinal fortitude? Yeah, I'm glad you didn't have me define intestinal fortitude. I was worried that you were going there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think it's unique. It's a unique, unique characteristic to have. And um, this crew's done that. They have trust in each other. Um, to get that done now, rather have it not have to be that way and bigger leads. But um, uh, the bottom line is, you know, you, that you, you attempt to win the football game and do it the best way you can against great competition in this league. So um, at times you're going to have to reach down and just reach a little deeper and really, uh, you know, whatever that term is to get in there and use that intestinal fortitude so to, to get you over the hump. So, and most of it ends up being trusting guys around you and then strain to make the play a little bit better. And that's what our guys have done to this point. 
Got four more. We'll go right down the line, starting with Aaron. Go ahead, Aaron. Coach, you were around when the NFL kind of revamped the concussion protocol back in 2017. What's different now than, I guess, before then? Is it harder to get your hands around those guys and kind of prepare them? What's different on you guys' end? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a chance, uh, uh, you know, back in the day that Patrick comes in. I mean, you know, comes back in. And, and uh, you know, this, this is a way of protecting, I think, the player most of all. <clears throat> also protecting the trainer and doctors that are having to make decisions there. So, um, you know, that, that's, uh, I think it's a plus all the way around. Um, I think Patrick could tell you, I mean, you saw him run up the tunnel and by the time he got to that point, he was feeling pretty good. So but, you know, there, there's a certain protocol that you have to follow. And, uh, and, and, uh, and that takes it out of the, the trainer's hand and player's hand and doctor's hand. Yeah. Go next to Sam McDowell. Go ahead, Sam. Hey, Brad, I'll have a real quick follow to this. But Andy, you said last night um, that, that Patrick passed all the deals. Uh, does that mean that he was or was not diagnosed with a concussion and that it, it was an independent doctor's decision or, or the team's decision not to put him back in? Yeah, so um, he didn't <laughs> – yeah, he passed it. When, when you, there, you still have to go through all the protocol. It's a, there's a day-to-day -day plan on that and how they go about it. So especially if a player staggers right there and maybe they've got to go through some things. So, you know, that, that ends up being important. Um, and then uh, I'm sure you, you've chatted with him today, even though he hasn't been in the facility. What's the message as far as how he's feeling today? Well, he felt good enough not to have to do a press conference. We'll go next to Michelle Steele. Go, ahead, Michelle. Hey, Coach. Um, yeah, you've talked about Eric Bieniemy in the past. I know, and his role in the Chiefs' um, run of su success. Is it confounding, confounding to you, maybe, that we're in another hiring cycle and he he just hasn't gotten that opportunity yet to be a head coach? Yeah. Um, I mean, everybody knows what I think of Eric and <clears throat> what kind of head coach I think he'd be. And um, maybe the best thing I can tell you is I hope he goes to the NFC um, uh, when he has that opportunity. But if he, whoever gets him, it, I think is a very lucky organization. Um, somebody that uh, I that I've come across, one of the few people I've come across that has the leadership skills that he has, the ability to lead men in this crazy game that we're in. And um, for those guys through his leadership to play at a Pro Bowl level. And so um, when he gets his hands on you uh, figuratively, um, he he does wonders with athletes and he's able to maximize their abilities on the field. And he gives them um, that extra boost uh, to be a productive person off the field. And uh, somebody that I would love my son to have played for. And we'll go last to Pete Sweeney. Good Pete. Brad, if you don't mind, I have just one quick thing after this, but uh, coach, I, I know this is a hypothetical right now, but if Chad has to go from what you'd be willing to share, just how drastically might that change your, your strategic plan this weekend? Yeah. So when we were in the game, it, uh, there wasn't anything that I had to stay away from on, on this game plan. Uh, when Chad was in there, I checked with EB and Mike on it and they were comfortable. I checked with Chad on it. He said, just call it the way way uh you, you had planned so um that's that's how we we went about it as we sat down there and gathered our information you know and then my other thing was you you mentioned joe and i believe that's joe blimeyer a lot this year um we know how you feel about the enemy and kafka how bright is his future based upon what he does day to day for you guys yeah nice no, sharp um we're, we're blessed uh, with that uh cory mate is another one who <clears throat> works with Andy Heck and, and works with all that RPO game and uh, does a great job there. Joe Blaymeyer, Mike Kafka. I mean, these are all good young football coaches um, that are going to be coaching a long time, I think, in this league. So 
uh, smart guys. And, uh, and I want to slate, you know, Greg Lewis and Elin and um, Coach Hack, I probably don't talk enough about. He, he's a tremendous, so yeah, he does a great job. Coach, we appreciate the time. Thanks for joining us. Okay, thank you.